Meet me in Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 7, or really meet me in Daniel chapter 5. You'll understand in just a minute. Daniel chapter 5. We're going to go back to Daniel 7 in just a minute. Now, I have a question for you. How many of you received the bulletin via email? Most of you. Okay. I'm going to ask you to do me a favor tomorrow. I am going to send out a link in the body of the email that comes with the bulletin. And it's going to have a simple survey with 10 questions. Some of them are really easy. Matter of fact, all of them are really easy. Um, I just am taking a quick 10 question survey. Um, some of it has to do with some other information, but you'll see that if you will fill that out, um, I promise you when you start reading it, you'll start figuring out what that means and what it's going to mean in the future. But there's 10 questions that I want to know your answer to. So if you will fill those out, um, that will submit them to me. And then I'll be able to put them all together, and I'm going to do some information. I'm actually going to preach a sermon on this information, um, so your participation is, is really needed, because I'd sure hate to have no information there to go on. Uh, then I'm going to teach a series of classes based on this information, as well as some Monday night programs based on this information, and then use it to help fill in some gaps in the 2023 sermon calendar. Um, I start preparing my sermon calendar in October. I know it's a little early, um, but I'm trying to get a jump start on it this year. Um, so August is, is when I'm choosing to start the thought process. So if you'll fill that out when it comes to your email, that will help me uh, greatly. So we're in our class on Daniel. We've studied Daniel chapter 1, 2, 3, and 4. And we have found in all of those chapters that Daniel and, and those acquaintances of Daniel, they kept their faith, they followed God. They, they came up against a nation of which they were in captivity, and yet somehow, by the way, what's the how? How, how did they do this? Did they do it on their own? Or they fa were they favored on their own, or was God involved in the entire book of Daniel so far as we've been studying? God's been right there in every chapter as we've been studying, and we've seen that. So we've seen people encounter the king and all the things that take place with him. And we've been studying in what I call chronological order, as the events take place. Now, I've asked you to meet me in Daniel chapter 5 because I want you to see something. We just left chapter 4 last week, and, and I want you to see the difference from chapter 4 to chapter 5. Look at the very first word, Belshazzar. Now, the previous king was Nebuchadnezzar. So you automatically know in the very first scene, Belshazzar, the king of chapter 5, verse 1, something is different. So you make your way over to Daniel chapter 7. You read these words, in the first year of Belshazzar. So Daniel chapter 7 is out of order in the chronological events of things. And that's why we're jumping ahead to chapter 7. And then next week we're going to go to chapter 8, then we're going to go back to chapter 5, and then we're going to end in chapter 6 in this particular arrangement and keep going through our chapter. So remember what's happened. We have went from Nebuchadnezzar to Belshazzar, two different kings. Now God's people have served under, and that's where we find ourselves. The scene has been set, and Nebuchadnezzar no longer is in control, and Belshazzar is in control and if you want some more historical evidence or historical type reading that you'd like to do, if you really want to dig in on, let's say, exactly who this was and what the exact years this king was reigning in, uh, go see that book on Rex Turner. There's one in the library, and then my copy is in notebook form. Matter of fact, it's still uh, right here. But that is a resource that will take you through all of these different kings and kingdoms. But in our study, we're not exactly focusing on who it was. Because in reality, the who doesn't matter. It could have been the most evil person in the world. The who doesn't matter. It could have been in any time of which has existed. The time doesn't matter. Because here's the fact that we're focusing on in our study of the book of Daniel. We have God and his people. We have God and his people. Okay, The same is true today for you and I. I'm going to say it a little bit differently. But it doesn't matter who's president. I, I know it matters. I know, but listen to me. It doesn't matter who's president because it's God and his people. And that's the reality I want us to focus on here on exactly what we're studying about inside the book of Daniel, especially here in Daniel chapter 7 because we're going to have this vivid vision that takes place. And we'll go through the chapter in four different areas. We'll look at the vision of four and what we'll see in the first 
Uh, eight verses is four different groupings. Uh, these are going to be four different kings, four different kingdoms, four different dominions. And we're just going to see them for who they are in the description that's given by Daniel. And we'll notice by Daniel in just a few moments as well. Then we're going to look at the Ancient of Days. And what we're going to notice is there is one who puts all things in order. Now that was not Daniel. It was not Nebuchadnezzar. It's not going to be Belshazzar. There is one who puts all things in order. And I'm calling it the Ancient of Days. You'll see that in just a few moments. Then we're going to look at a dominion. And this is going to bring our minds back to Daniel chapter 2. And it's going to bring our minds to Acts chapter 2. It's going to bring our minds to very much in the time of which we're living in. And we're going to see the dominion that's described inside of this chapter, Daniel chapter 7. And then we're going to see the vision. And inside of the vision being understood, we're going to see a key passage. As a matter of fact, I'll go ahead and tell you what it is. It's Daniel 7.26. Daniel 7.26, and we're going to let that be the key to what we're studying tonight together in Daniel chapter 7. So let's start off in Daniel chapter 1, or Daniel chapter 7, verse 1. Daniel 7, verse 1, and let's see this writing, this thing that's taking place about what's happening and what's going on. We've already noticed Daniel 7, 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream, telling the main facts. So what you and I have in Daniel chapter 7 is the writing. Daniel has had this dream, this vision, and I kind of love how it's described. He had a dream and visions of his head while on his bed. That, to me, is kind of rhythmic as it goes through. But have you ever woke up after having a dream and remembering how vivid it was? Now, the dream that Daniel's having and the dreams that you and I might have are much different. Because Daniel is going to find out some information that Daniel would never know unless God put that into Daniel's mind. So we're going to have something come to Daniel, and, but what I want you to see is the regime, the reign, the ruler has changed. And what we're going to notice is Daniel's not going to act any different. Daniel's not going to talk any different. Daniel's not going to react any different. This king, it doesn't seem to affect Daniel. But here's what we know. He wrote these things down of which he saw. Evidently, they were important enough to Daniel. And we're going to see a phrase twice that's going to be important for us in this. So Daniel said this in Daniel 7.2. Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring upon the great sea, and four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. Here's the sight. Daniel sees four great beasts. Now, we're going to define them in just a moment as the Scripture tells them. We're not necessarily going to focus on what they are right now and what they represent right now, but I want you just to see the scenes. Daniel evidently was troubled by what he saw. The visions of his head troubled him, and he writes these things down. And he sees, interestingly enough, the four winds of heaven of which were stirring upon the great sea. Now, I want to key something into us in verse 2. Is there an area, is there a time, is there a place, is there a who, is there a where, is there a what that God is not in control of? Is there anything God cannot do? Is there anywhere God cannot reach? Is there anywhere God cannot hear? Is there anywhere God cannot see? That's how this kind of starts out. Of all of the earth that's going on, Daniel is seeing this and God can reach to all the earth's and there's four that's being described. The first is a line. It's inside of verse 4. He says the first was, I want you to see this, was like a line. Does this mean that Daniel saw an actual line? It means he saw something that looked like a line. There's a representation going to take place in this of, of, of verse 4. He said there was a line and had eagle's wings. By the way, pause with me there. Have you ever seen a line with eagle's wings? be pretty neat, huh? Well, I don't know if a flying line would be great, uh, but uh, that's what Daniel saw, okay? And, and, and there's a reason I brought that up. You, you think Daniel had questions? If you saw a line with eagle's wings, would you have questions? Boy, I would. I, I have no problem telling you. I, I'd want to know. And he says, I watched till its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the earth and, and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. Boy, there's a lot going on there. 
And then the scenes change. Look into verse 5. As he's watching these things, he sees suddenly something else, verse 5, and suddenly another beast. A second, like a bear, was raised up on one side, had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth, and, and they said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. Well, the lion was interesting, but the bear, the bear has been devouring. Now, I, I don't know about you, but I've not been around many bears. Maybe randomly seeing one in Gatlinburg or Pigeon Forge, you might see one there. How many people want to see a bear tonight when you go home? Kind of severe, huh? Especially what's being described here. A bear who has ribs between its what? It's teeth. Now there's something I definitely don't want. I don't mind seeing a bear, but I don't want to see a bear's teeth. Two, th two reasons why. Number one, if a bear's teeth are visible, you're probably pretty close to the bear. But number two, if a bear's teeth are visible, he's probably hungry. And evidently here, this one was told, arise and devour much flesh. And as that's going on, suddenly, another, and it looked like a leopard, and we see here, which had one on its, or had something on its back. It had four winged of a bird. The beast also had four heads. And dominion was given to it. So we've had a lion, a bear who is devouring with bones in its teeth. We now have a leopard who, interestingly enough, in this particular scene, had on its back a four wings of a bird and had four heads. Got some questions there. But what I want you to see is this. And dominion was given to it. Keep that phrase in your mind. That's going to mean something to us later. Right now, we're just gathering facts. We're just seeing in our minds what Daniel was able to see. And then finally, as all this is taking place, we read this about the dreadful. Uh, verse uh, 7 through verse 8. After this I saw in the night visions and beheld a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had a huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one coming up from among it, before whom the three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words. The first one was kind of out there. The second one got a little bit bigger. The third one kind of became extravagant, but the fourth one, boy, the fourth one was detailed. Now remember in verses 1 through 3, it says Daniel wrote these things down. He, he wrote the events of these things down to remember them, to write about them. And this is what he wrote. That to me is quite impressive because I don't know about you, but I would have wanted to raise my hand and said, I got a question Matter of fact, i got four of them. Wasn't that what you want to know? I've got four of them. What, what were these animals? What, what do they represent? What, what do they have to do with me? Why am I seeing them? The lion, the bear, the leopard, and then the one that's not even described as an earthly animal, the dreadful. It was consuming and trampling everything within its sight. And that was the visions of Daniel tonight. I'd want to know what that meant, wouldn't you? I would want to know, in a selfish way, what that means to me. Because remember what Daniel already knows. Daniel already knows the kingdoms of men are controlled by God. Daniel already knows the kingdom of God is being controlled by God. Daniel already knows that he's going to remain faithful to God. And Daniel has already, time and time again, told what the dreams were and told what the dreams meant. But Daniel wasn't having the dreams yet. Now Daniel is. And these things are before the minds of Daniel. And thus I want to put something before your mind and before mine. I want us to talk about the ancient of days. And what I want to do is I want to walk through the next section that starts in verse, uh, verse 9. And I want us to see something that takes place. And I want you to see the one. It's here in verse 9. I watched till thrones were put in place. And the Ancient of Days was seated, his garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. 
Who's that? Who is the ancient of days? Well, let's go through a list of things and, and let's try to determine who the ancient of days is. Is the ancient of days Daniel, number one? It's not Daniel because Daniel's having this dream. And, and for you and I, Daniel's writing this dream. It's in chapter 7, what we'd call chapter 7. Daniel's writing about this. Was it Belshazzar? I, I don't think it was Belshazzar to you. Nor as much do I think it was Nebuchadnezzar. Because the kingdoms of men, so far in the book... And I'm going to say it that way because we're going to see this go through the book. The kingdoms of men have not been elevated to the place of God yet, have they? And by the way, will the kingdoms of men ever be equal with the kingdom of God? No, they won't. So I don't think it's anything to do with earthly kingdoms. So who does the ancient one, or who is the ancient one, and who has the power to put thrones and powers in place? It's God, correct? So hold that thought, and let's just keep going through it and, and see this ancient one. It's inside of verse 10. You read this. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. By the way, notice the him there. A thousand thousands ministered to him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was settled, and the books were opened. Oh, this throne room is official. This throne room has purpose. This throne room is filled with thousands and thousands and tens of thousands. And they all stand before who? Him. And then listen to what it says. The courts were seated. Respect and reverence was given. And then notice this. And the books were opened. Now... You and I don't have an exact answer to what these books are. But there's two guesses to what these books could be. Uh, some believe these to be the books of life. You know, where names are written and sealed before heaven, before God. However, I want to throw another wrinkle into your brain in this particular occasion because all we know so far, and we, we've already said this is God, is God is sitting before the throne, thousands have reverence before him, and these books are open because he is the one that controls the court. May I throw an extra wrinkle in your brain? Could this also be the books of the kingdoms of men? God who is in control of all things, God who controls the rise and fall of nations, you hold that because when we kind of learn later in a few minutes what this lion and leopard and all these beasts were, it's just a thought. Now, I'm not telling you you have to have that thought, but just keep it in your mind to let you and I think. But before him, these books are open, and evidently they're very vital because when the books are open, that's after reverence was given and after the court was seated. This is the opening proceedings of what's getting ready to happen. And then watch, watch what happens. He said, I watched then because of the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking. Pause with me there. Do you remember back in verse 8? The mouth of the one who had eyes, the very last part of verse 8, what was he speaking? Pompous words, flagrant words. You could even use this word, foul type words, arrogant words were being, speak, were being spoken. And now in this, he, in this particular scene, he hears the sound of pompous words which the horn was speaking, and he says, I watched till the beast was slain and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. Whatever the beast was, when it stood in the court of God, did it survive? It didn't, okay? Whatever those books were, whether they are the Lamb's book of life, or, or whether they are something in the regards to the affairs of men, whatever they were, this one that stood before them with these words didn't survive. There was a destruction. And then in the scenes, as you walk into verse 12, he says, as for the rest of the beast which is interesting because Daniel hasn't forgotten them, and they're evidently in this scene that he's seeing as well. He said they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. But I want you to think about something. There was one who had the power to destroy the beast, 
whomever it was. There was one who had the power to prolong the season and time of the other three descriptive animals, descriptive beasts being given. And there was one who could do all those things with his authority and with his power. That's not mankind. That is God. You and I are not in control of the rise and fall of nations. But it is God who is in control of all things of his creation. Just keep that in mind. Because that's going to play into our minds as we think about the dominion that was given. And as he was watching these, and I like that he calls them night visions. As he was watching these night visions, behold one, in this particular scene here in verse 13, he says, behold one, like the son of man. By the way, who was called the son of man? Christ was called the son of man. I guess I need to rephrase that. Who is the son of man? Not just that he was called that. Who, who, who is the son of man? It's Christ. And in this occasion, I was watching these visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven, he came in with, to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. All right, here's another one of which he said was like the Son of Man. And he says he comes before the one of which had thrones, of which had reverence and respect to those tens and tens of thousands, the one of which that beast came before, the one of which the other three came before. And now the one, the Son of Man, comes, and he comes in the clouds in this particular scene, and he comes to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him before him. Now another is standing before the Ancient of Days. And we're going to talk about dominion as you rolled into verse 14. We're going to talk about dominion because there's something that's very important. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom. Pause with me there. Remember in Daniel chapter 2, verse 44, what was going to be established? A kingdom. A kingdom was going to be established. Who was going to establish the kingdom? The Christ, remember? If you'll allow me to steal language from chapter 7, the Son of Man was going to establish his kingdom. And let me ask you a question about that kingdom. It was said twice in Daniel 2.44. How long was that kingdom going to last? Forever. Now, remember this of Daniel chapter 2. What was the great, and I'm going to use this word, vision that was before us? What was that great statue representing? Remember the clay feet and go all the way through to the top? What was that representing? Kingdoms of men. The kingdoms of men. But there was a kingdom of which was going to be given. And Daniel says, as he's in this vision, he sees the one coming before the ancient one. It was like the son of man. And he was given dominion. He was given glory. He was given a kingdom. Now, to signify what that kingdom is, let's read the rest of the verse. He was given these things, and in that we read inside of verse 14, that all peoples, nations, languages should serve him. Pause there. That language is synonymous in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament of talking about the church. Because who can come and be a part of the church that Christ built? All peoples, all nations, all languages. That's a little lost on us, okay? I, I, I can say that because we live in a very geographically locked portion of the world. Uh, how many of you have ever been out of the United States or out of this region of the world? One, two, three. Oh, more than I thought. But those are pretty rare experiences, aren't they? We've not experienced much more than here, have we? I mean, we've had our times out, but many times not for long, many times not in great other cultures, many times not in this area. So, so kind of what we do sometimes is we only think about American things. That's all we've ever known, I understand. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not diminishing that. But all peoples, all nations, all languages 
How many people, when America was founded, could come into America? What was kind of the motto for a long time? Out of many, how many? One. Out of many, one. Referencing to a nation where many could come and be one. Now, I am not, do not hear that I am suggesting that America is connected to the kingdom. Not what I'm saying. But in this, all these people could come. What I'm saying is we sometimes, we, we, we don't see the rest of the world. But in this, all of the world could come. That's the kingdom that's being described. And then he says this. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. Who's going to have an everlasting dominion? Who's going to have an everlasting kingdom? It's Christ. Christ is who we're talking about. Which may I suggest to you earlier in verse 9, this ancient of days, who is that? That's God the Father. It's God the Father. I think we need to make those distinctions clearly to our minds in this particular scene. He says, which will not pass away. So the dominion and the kingdom of Jesus will not pass away. And by the way, read the last part of the verse inside of verse 14. In his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. That brings us back to Daniel 2.44. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about the church. And may I suggest to you and I tonight that what we're talking about in Daniel chapter 7 is once again the rise and fall of nations. But we get a glimpse into something that I think is rather interesting in the previous segment when we talked about the Ancient of Days because these nations and these rulers, it seemed to be coming before God's court. And those nations would rise and fall based upon the books that were open of which were used in that court. I want to ask you a real intent question. And I hope it will help us see what's going on. Then we've got to march through the next segment to, to get to that verse I want us to see. Do you believe that God is in control today? I hope we do. I really hope we do. I know sometimes the world seems very chaotic. I'm with you. I know sometimes we, don't, we can't back up far enough to see the big picture. I, I know I get it. But who is still in control? And in chapter 7, those nations that would rise and those nations that would fall, who was the judge? It's not the surrounding nations. It was not the nation itself of which was being judged who was it? It was the Almighty One, the Ancient of Days. He is in control. Now that's a lesson that is almost the majority theme of the book of Daniel. It's the subtle theme. It almost comes up in every segment of the book of Daniel because in every segment, who's in control? God is. And Nebuchadnezzar was able to see this, and Belshazzar is really going to struggle as we walk through what's happening with his particular scene. So let's see the vision being understood. So here's what I want you to see. I want you to see the trouble. After all that was over, Daniel says that he was grieved in his spirit, or his spirit was grieved in his body, and the visions of his head troubled me. Wouldn't that trouble you? Troubles us right now a little bit, doesn't it? Now, in this scene, may I make this suggestion, however we may look at whoever these kingdoms were, the beasts and these other animals, which I suggest to you they're kingdoms, I would suggest to you that they had to do with the coming of the kingdom. I would suggest they have to do with the coming of the kingdom. Now let me ask you this, has the kingdom been established? Has the church been established? I suggest that's where we were ramping up to. Now, God is still in control of the rise and fall of nations. However, we don't have books in recent days written talking about things in times of which we would understand. Is God still in control? The answer is yes. These things bothered Daniel. It would bother us. Verse 16 gives us the answer. He said, I came near to one of those which stood by. Daniel's still in this vision. And he asked the truth of all of this. What does all this mean? And he made the interpretations of it. Daniel 7 verse 17, those great beasts which are four are four kings which arise out of the earth. So there's four kings, four kingdoms that are coming. And remember there's another kingdom. The church is coming. The church is coming. 
And in this, we read about a possession. It's in verse 18. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. I love that the word ever is used three times. Forever, even forever and ever. How long, if you are his, will you be his? Now, I understand just as much as you do that every person in this room, you, me, all of us included, have the capability and the opportunity to walk away from God right now and never return. But that's not the definition of a Christian. The definition of a Christian is one who stays with God forever, forever, and ever. There's the definition given here. So don't misconstrue verse 18 saying, once someone's in the kingdom, they can never leave. Because that's not what this particular scene is saying. Those who are in the kingdom can have it forever and ever and ever. And as you walk through, you make yourself into verse 19, you have the truth. Then I wish to know the truth about that fourth beast. Daniel says, I got another question. These four beasts, he says, this fourth one was different. And remember that in the particular scenes of the chapter. That last one, it, it, its, its depiction was, was full of vision and full of details and he wanted to know what was different because it was different, exceedingly dreadful, its teeth of iron, nails of bronze, which devoured and broke into pieces and trampled the residue with its feet. He says, I want to know more about that. He, he, there's this look inside of verses 20 and 21, the ten horns on its head, which you read about the one horn that came up before, the, the three failed, namely the horn which its eyes, its mouth spoke pompous words, whose appearance is greater than his fellows. I was watching, and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. He says, I want to know who this is, but I want you to see something. I almost picked verse 22 and 23 to be the key to the chapter. He said, this happened until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was made. Now we're starting to get the truth. Daniel says, I want to know the truth about all these things, especially that fourth piece he really wanted to know. And here it was. God judges the nations. Now, We'll get into 22 and 23 in just a minute, but I want to ask you a question. Is God judging our nation? If so, if so, the answer is yes, but I'm using the if so language. If so, and we were to stand before the almighty ancient of days right now, what would he judge? I saw people go, okay. And there, ladies and gentlemen, lies the beauty of the Christian. Do you remember the Old Testament one asked God, if I can find 50 people who are righteous, would you save them? What was God's answer? Are there 50 in this room tonight? Stay righteous. Do you see how valuable you are? If I can find ten, will you save them? What did God say? Are there ten in this room tonight? Do you see how valuable you are? We don't think about that very often because sometimes we look at our country and all we can say is evil, evil, bad, bad. Folks, aren't you in the country too? Good, good, righteous, righteous. Just remember that sometimes. Sometimes I think we, we have a, a very poor view of things. I, I know we need to stand where God stands, but if you stand with God, there's a lot of good in this country left. He says all this happened at the almost high God. He, he, he judged them, and, and in this fourth one, he, thus he said, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom of the earth, which shall be different from all the other kingdoms, shall devour the whole, the whole earth and trample and break it into pieces. He talks about these ten, these ten horns. The ten horns are kings who arise of this kingdom. Evidently, one of these kingdoms is much bigger than the other. And they will rise out of them, another will arise out of them, and he shall be different from the first ones, and shall subdue the three kings. He'll speak pompous words against the Most High. Mm. That's not good, is it? To speak evil words against the God of heaven, the Almighty Ancient One. He shall persecute the saints of the Most High. And shall intend to change times and law, then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and for times and half a time. Now, I can't tell you how long times, time, and half a time is. If you can define that, I'd love to hear your opinion on it. But you know what that's going to be? 
just like my opinion on it. it it's, it's not going to change the text. What's the text saying? For a time, God's people were persecuted. Now, we can look into history and see times where God's people were persecuted. We could put some of the th these things together, and we could make some of these things work out in our minds. But there he is, and this is verse, 20, or verse 26, where we need to be the judge. This is the important. He said, but the court shall be seated. When the judge walks in the courtroom in the United States, what happens? What does the, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to get this term right, but I'm going to use this term anyways, chief bailiff. I don't know who that guy is, but you know what he says. What's he say? All rise. All rise. Why? Who's coming in? The judge. The judge. Why is, why is it that we rise before the judge? Respect for two reasons. Number one, the office of the judge, but number two, the law of the land. All rise. That, that, that's what that means. But I want you to see it in this scene. The court shall be seated. When the judge enters, what was the courtroom doing? Standing. And this one that's being described here is talked about in verse 26. And they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it forever. This one that was doing evil, is he going to survive the test of time? Nope. Not a chance. But who is going to proceed over the court? The judge. And that, folks, is the key to the chapter. We could tonight spend a whole lot of time looking at every one of these beasts, what they were, who they could be, and you can go look at this guy's writings. He's got a lot of writings on it. He lists multiple groups of which this could be. But I think we sometimes, when we study the Bible, we see this obscure fact over here, and, and boy, we walk to it, and it doesn't mean anything. It's not going to change the interpretation thereof. But there is something that's important here. There's a judge. He is called in this scene, as we've already noticed in this chapter, the Ancient of Days. And when he was seated, verse 9, when he was there, the court showed reverence and respect because there is a law. Now, some people say God's law is not applicable to those that are not His. In other words, God's law only applies to Christians. Is that the case? It's not the case. Because the judge here, if you'll allow me to steal from the time we're reading, the judge here did not say, well, the law of Israel only applied to Israel, so therefore we'll let you try again. Is that what he said? Therefore, with you and I, if we're making application to us, does God's law apply to our whole world? Yes. Every person that is accountable unto God is under his law. Now, are there people who are not accountable before God? Can you list me some classifications of people who are not accountable before God? Children. Children. Why are they not accountable before God? They're not responsible for what? Their actions. Are there others in this life that are not accountable before God? That's right. That's, that's, that's some, there are people in this life who of no decision of their own, sometimes because of decisions of their own, who are mentally incapable of making those such decisions. But here's who I'm talking about. I'm talking about accountable folks. Every one of you tonight made a decision to be here. You know what that tells me? You are accountable to God's law. You are accountable and you are under God's law. And there's a judge. And when he is seated, he will use his law. And in this occasion, God used his laws against the kingdoms or rulers of men. By the way, it really matters who rules in the affairs of men. Earlier I said this, it doesn't matter who is the president. It does matter, doesn't it? It does. Now... We're not going to get into tonight who makes a good president. We're not going to do that. But I'm going to tell you one fact that would change this country. And I don't know how we accomplish this, but if we can get a Christian in the White House, you think that would change things? 
I don't know how we do that. Y'all figure that out and let me know. But that's what would make a difference because these kings, these rulers, they were evil, but there was a judge. That's the key to the book. And there was a giving, verse 27. Then the kingdom and dominion and greatness of the kingdoms of the whole heavens shall be given to the people and the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. All dominions shall serve and obey him. In verse 28, this is the end of the account. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly troubled me, and my countenance changed, but I kept the matter in my heart. I bet so, Daniel. <laughs> I bet so, because here, here's what Daniel knew. This is forthcoming. This is future. Daniel had a future. Wow. If you and I knew the future, would it change our countenance? Oh, oh, it would. Whether good or evil, it would change the way we view things. But I want you to see something. But I kept the matter in my heart. I have pondered, verse 28, so many times trying to figure out what the matter was. And that's why I chose verse 26. I, keep, I reference that again. There is a judge. There is a judge. That's the matter. That's what matters. Because at the end of the day... All kingdoms will be judged by who? The judge. And at the end of the day, all people will be judged by who? The judge. That is the matter. That is the matter. And he never let this leave his heart. So here's my question, and we'll let the class be yours, and you can reclaim two whole minutes I took three minutes last week. I still owe you a minute, or two weeks ago. I still owe you a minute. I, we'll get it back eventually. Then we'll fall behind again. So we've already lost 30 seconds there. Let me ask you this. Will we keep the matter in our heart that God is the judge? Because Daniel did. As we walked through our class tonight, we saw Daniel, who now has seen a regime change, and who's at the center of his life? God. Thank you so much for your comments, your participation. I really enjoy it. Thank you.